once upon a midnight dreary, as I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. As I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly I heard a tapping, as if someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor,' I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Merely this and nothing more. It was October 7th, 1849, and the author of those famous words was dead. Edgar Allan Poe would become one of the most celebrated authors in American history, but his life was a series of tragedies punctuated by bouts of literary genius. And his mysterious death at just the age of 40, and the events that led up to it, deserve to be remembered. He was born in Boston in January of 1809 to two actors, David and Eliza Poe. His father left the year after he was born, and his mother died of tuberculosis the year after that. Poe and his two siblings were adopted by John and Francis Allen of Richmond, Virginia. Allen was a relatively well-to-do tobacco merchant who, upon the death of a rich uncle, inherited an estimated $750,000. That amount of money would be worth $17 million today. Historians have preserved some of Allen's early ledgers, and on the back, Poe was already writing verses, showing his interest in becoming an author and not following in his adopted father's footsteps. In 1826, Poe left Richmond to attend the University of Virginia, leaving behind a sweetheart, Sarah Elmira Royster. Elmira was a 15-year-old neighbor with whom Poe, at age 16, had fallen in love. He wrote Elmira multiple letters from the university, which, according to some, Elmira's family intercepted because they disapproved of the match. They convinced Elmira to marry the wealthy Alexander B. Shelton in 1827. She would remain married until Shelton's death from pneumonia in July 1844. Meanwhile, Poe, who was so broke from gambling and John Allen's refusal to send him further money, was burning his furniture to stay warm at the university. He dropped out and returned to Richmond and learned about his sweetheart's marriage to another man. Poe was, apparently, heartbroken. His relationship with John Allen became more strained, and shortly thereafter he left the Allen home in Richmond. Poe never reconciled with his adopted father, who even left Poe out of his will. But despite this lack of support, Edgar Allan Poe was determined to become a famous author. According to some historians, his first published work, Tamerlane and Other Poems, was inspired by his failed romance with Elmira. In Tamerlane, Poe wrote, I saw no heaven, but in her eyes. He was only 18 years old when it was published. Poe published Tamerlane anonymously as a Bostonian, and only 50 copies were printed. Only a few of these idly sought-after tomes still exist today. He lied about his age to join the military, saying he was 22 years old when he was actually 18, and used a fake name. Edgar Perry. Poe spent two years in the military and obtained the rank of sergeant major when he revealed to his commanding officer his deception. He was discharged in order to attend the United States Military Academy at West Point, which some biographies claim he hated. So Poe acted up and was court-martialed after only eight months and kicked out of West Point. But in his brief time there, Poe made friends and fellow cadets lent him money to publish a second book of poems in 1831. He included a dedication to them, which read, to the U.S. Corps of Cadets, this volume is respectfully dedicated. After being booted from West Point, going back to Richmond wasn't an option. John Allen's wife and Poe's adopted mother, Frances, had died a few years previously, and Allen had remarried. Instead, Poe went to Baltimore, Maryland, to stay with his paternal aunt, Maria Clem, and her daughter, Poe's cousin, Virginia, in March 1831. His career started to take a turn for the better when he won a literature contest and was invited to become an editor for the magazine Southern Literary Messenger. Part of Poe's success was due to the fact that he wrote masterful literary reviews, not holding back in his criticisms of other authors, to the delight of the publication's readers. In one of his reviews about a poem Poe disliked, he wrote, A more absurdly flat affair was never before paraded to the world, with so grotesque an air of bombast and assumption. The insulted poet's wife was later to say about Poe, he did not play with his pen, he wielded it. One of the authors Poe offended with his reviews was Rufus Griswold. After Poe's death, Griswold wrote a scathing obituary and followed it up with a biography that portrayed Poe as a hard-drinking womanizer in an effort to permanently blacken Poe's name. According to the Poe Museum of Richmond, Virginia, Griswold's plan backfired and more readers bought Poe's books after the dark biography was published than ever before. But one part of Griswold's biography appears to be true. Edgar Allan Poe did indeed binge drink. 
Some historians claim that Poe temporarily lost his job at the Southern Literary Messenger when he showed up to work inebriated and only got it back after he promised to behave in the future. Author and historian John Walsh, who has written a nonfiction book about Poe called Midnight Dreary, claims Poe was not a drunkard in the way usually meant by the term. He points to the extraordinary writing and editing Poe was able to produce as proof of his sobriety and occasional lapses into binges. Walsh writes, As always with this type of alcoholism, the unsettling fact was its combined certainty and unpredictability. After long periods of perfect sobriety, he seemed almost bound to fail again. And those who cared about him had to live with that relentless expectation. One of the people who cared about him was his first cousin, Virginia, whom Poe married in 1836. Witnesses told authorities Virginia was of age, but she was actually only 13. Poe was more than a decade her senior. Poe's efforts at his new job led to the Southern Literary Messenger becoming one of the most popular magazines in the southern United States, and he thought his pay was not commiserate with his results. So he left the Messenger and moved north, first living in New York and then Philadelphia, working for different publications, in an effort to earn more money to support himself in Virginia. The literary world was a difficult place to earn a living in the early 1800s. Part of the problem was the lack of an international copyright, protecting the rights and income of authors. American publishers had the unfortunate habit of bootlegging British works rather than paying for original works. Another problem was instability in the business. Publications would spring up and then fall apart almost overnight. Throughout his career, Poe worked for numerous publications and planned to start one of his own. But his dream as a publisher crumbled because he lacked the money to support the venture. After years of struggling, Poe became famous when his classic work, The Raven, was published in January 1845, but he didn't become rich from the success. Historians say he was paid only $9 for the work, but he was able to springboard his fame into a series of rather successful speaking tours where he'd read aloud from his poetry and then engage the audiences in question and answer sessions. When Poe's wife Virginia died of tuberculosis in 1847, he went into another tailspin. He found himself unable to ride, and alcohol took front and center stage in his life once more. For a while, he courted a poet named Sarah Helen Whitman, but their relationship fell apart. For her part, Whitman seemed infatuated with Poe before she even met him, writing to a friend, I can never forget the impressions I felt in reading a story of his for the first time. I experienced a sensation of such intense horror that I dared neither look at anything he had written, nor even utter his name. But by degrees this terror took on the character of fascination, and I devoured with a half-reluctant and fearful avidity every line that fell from his pen. Poe, on the other hand, first saw Whitman when he was walking by her rose garden with a friend in 1845. Some historians claim he revised the classic poem to Helen to reflect his experience on seeing Whitman for the first time. Thy hyacinth hair, thy classic face, thy naiad airs have brought me home to the glory that was Greece, and the grandeur that was Rome. Others claim that the only muse for that poem was Helen of Troy. Whitman's mother didn't approve of the relationship between the poet and her daughter, so the couple had to meet in the Providence Library, called the Athenaeum. At one of their clandestine meetings, Whitman asked Poe if he had read Ulalume, which was published anonymously in the American Review. Poe revealed that he had not only read it, but that he was the author. He secretly signed the library's copy of the poem, which the librarians didn't discover until later. Various rumors persist about why Whitman canceled their engagement, but in addition to the opposition of her mother, she was apparently warned about Poe's alcoholism, and an attorney advised her to write a prenuptial agreement to keep her money out of Poe's hands. Whatever happened, they ended their engagement, and Poe returned to Richmond, Virginia. There he resumed his acquaintance with Sarah Elmira Royster Shelton, his childhood sweetheart, who had married a wealthy merchant. Now widowed, Elmira seemed at first reluctant to let Poe back into her life. When he first visited her, after decades away, he showed up on her doorstep on a Sunday morning while Elmira was on her way to church. Later, after Poe's death, she remembered that meeting, saying, I went down and was amazed to see him, but knew him instantly. He came up to me in the most enthusiastic manner and said, Oh, Elmira, is this you? She casually thanked him for his visit, and then went to Sunday services. Poe persisted, even though Elmira's two children didn't like the poet. In later years, they would confess to mocking the dark-haired man behind his back. In a letter to a friend, Elmira wrote that Poe asked her to marry him, and when she realized he was serious about it, I told him that if he would not take a positive denial, he must give me time to consider it. He said that love that hesitated was not love for him. But Poe was convinced that she shared his affections. About meeting his former childhood sweetheart, he wrote, 
I am convinced she loves me more devotedly than anyone I ever knew, and I cannot help loving her in return. They tentatively set a wedding date for October 17, 1849, when Poe was scheduled to return from a lucrative editing job up north. On his way out of Richmond, Poe stopped by the Southern Literary Messenger, the publication he used to work for, and gave John Thompson, one of the editors there, a poem. Thompson recalled Poe saying, here's a little trifle that may be worth something to you. When Poe left, Thompson opened the pages and read Annabel Lee for the first time. It was many and many a year ago, in a kingdom by the sea, that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabel Lee. And this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. It was to be the last complete poem written by Edgar Allan Poe. He left Richmond September 27th and then was discovered drunk and ill in Baltimore where he died in a hospital on October 7th. The circumstances of his death have been a mystery almost since they occurred. Some contemporaries of Poe claim that he was a victim of cooping, a type of kidnapping used by political parties at the time. In essence, they would snatch men off the streets, keeping them drunk and confined in the days before an election, and then forcing them to vote the way the group wanted them to, in an effort to falsely inflate votes. Proponents of this theory point to the fact that Poe was discovered drunk in a tavern that was being used as an election place, and wearing clothes so worn that they didn't seem to belong to him. Others claim Poe fell off the wagon, and then fell victim to alcohol withdrawal, called delirium tremens. Untreated victims of delirium tremens can die up to 40% of the time. It is a terrifying way to die, especially for those forced to witness it, as the victim may suffer from seizures and hallucinations, like insects under their skin or pink elephants. Poe's symptoms, as described by the doctors who attended him during his last few days, seem to fit the description of delirium tremens. Still other historians, like John Walsh, support a claim that Poe was attacked and left to die by angry relatives of Elmira, furious that she was going to marry a man with no money, a history of women troubles, and a habit of heavy drinking. His last words, according to some nurses, were garbled, but sounded like, Lord help my poor soul. Edgar Allan Poe was only 40 years old when he died. Edgar Allan Poe was buried in a Presbyterian cemetery in Baltimore. Only six mourners attended his funeral. Elmira didn't even know that he had died until she read about it in the newspaper. Though later in life she would refuse to talk about her time with Poe and sometimes deny ever having been engaged to him, one of her first letters to Poe's former mother-in-law described her grief as unbearable. It was the most severe trial I have ever had, and God alone knows how I can bear it. Perhaps Poe's life was best summed up by his obituary in the Richmond newspaper, The Daily Whig. We regret to learn that Edgar Allan Poe, Esquire, the distinguished American poet, scholar, and critic, died yesterday after an illness of some four or five days. This announcement, coming so sudden and unexpected, will cause poignant regret among all those who admire genius and who have sympathy for the frailties so often attending it. Now in Inge's sunny clime, where I used to spend my time serving of Her Majesty the Queen, of all the black-faced crew, the finest man I knew was Regimental Beastie, Gunga Din. Was Din, 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 you limpin' lump of brick dust, Gunga Din. High slippery hitherto, water bring it parry low, you squishy-nosed old idol, Gunga Din. Written in 1890, the poem Gunga Din was one of the most famous poems in the world in its time. Chronicles the life of a British soldier in India and offers an unlikely hero in the person of Gunga Din, the regimental water bearer, who represents an idea perhaps surprising to the soldier narrator that a person's worth is not defined by their race. The poem has inspired films and songs, and its famous last line, you're a better man than I am, Gunga Din, is an oft-quoted bit of praise. But the author of the poem, the youngest person ever to receive the Nobel Prize for Literature, lived a tragic life. Rudyard Kipling, the author of such beloved classics as The Jungle Book and Captain's Courageous, suffered an abusive and difficult childhood, went on to become one of the most famous authors of his time, but lived a life of tragedy. The father of three, only one of his children would survive him. The life 
and losses of Rudyard Kipling are history that deserve to be remembered. Rudyard Kipling was born to Lockwood Kipling, who was the head of an art school, and his wife Alice in Bombay, India on December 30, 1865. They entrusted the early care of their son to an Indian nurse, who carried the young Kipling with her during her daily duties to the bazaar. He was with her so much that Kipling's first language, and the one that he said he spoke in his dreams, was Hindi, but the nurse always reminded Kipling to speak only English to his parents, so that they didn't necessarily know the extent of his fluency. Kipling's parents were concerned about the health of their amiable son. He was nicknamed the little friend of the world because of his friendly attitude. And their second child, a daughter named Alice, whom everyone called Trix, who was born a few years later. Typhoid, cholera, and other epidemics were common, partially because the causes of the disease were unknown and the Kiplings believed their children would be safer from potential illness back in England. They found a boarding house in the south of England that seemed like the perfect place but they apparently didn't check all the appropriate references, and it was an unfortunate decision for Rudyard and Trix. The family that ran the boarding house, called the Holloways, told the children that their parents had left them behind in England because they had been bad. There never seemed to be enough to eat. Kipling recalled the lady of the house quizzing him about his daily activities, and then picking apart his every answer in an effort to catch him in a lie. The Holloways' son cruelly beat the five-year-old Kipling with his fists. If the children cried after receiving a letter from their parents, they were locked in the basement for an entire day. The word help was carved into the house's walls by one of the children kept by the Holloways. It was bleak. Kipling forever after called the place the House of Desolation. Later in life, Kipling wrote a semi-autobiographical novel entitled Ba Ba Black Sheep that detailed the lives of a six and three year old who were left in the care of an abusive family in the south of England. Kipling's readers didn't know that he had modeled the story after his own life. For when young lips have drunk deep of the bitter waters of hate, suspicion, and despair, all the love in the world will not wholly take away that knowledge, though it may turn darkened eyes for a while to the light and teach faith where no faith was. Baba Black Sheep, 1889. After Rudyard's mother came to take her children home six years later, she was putting Kipling to bed and went to give him a kiss good night. He automatically threw up his hands, as if to ward off an attack. It was then that she realized how awful the boarding house life had been to her children. The emotional scars ran deep. Trix would struggle with what might be now labeled as bipolar disorder for her entire life. Rudyard, on the other hand, had intermittent periods of what he called depression, and according to some historians, an inability to form a close relationship with his wife. Kipling said he dealt with his variable moods by working long hours, sometimes as much as 16 hours in a day. He would later write to a friend, My head is all queer, and I'm going to have to have it mended someday. But that someday never seemed to come. Kipling received his formal education at United Services College in Devon. It was another boarding school, and one at which he didn't necessarily thrive. He recalled being terrified as his fellow students hung him by his ankles out of the window on the fifth floor of a dormitory. Never particularly athletic, the dreamy and bookish Kipling was described as an indifferent student. Yet there be certain times in a young man's life when, through great sorrow or sin, all the boy in him is burnt and seared away, so that he passes at one step to the more sorrowful state of manhood. The Dream of Duncan Perinus, 1884. But there were echoes of Kipling's earlier amiable attitude towards the world. One of his classmates remembered him as a capering, podgy little fellow, as precocious as ever could be. When he finished his time at United Services College, Kipling took a job at a newspaper near his parents in Lahore, India, which is now in Pakistan. Kipling began publishing his poetry, which was incredibly well received by the public almost from the beginning of his career. He formed a close relationship with an American publicist in London named Walcott Ballastier, and when Ballastier unexpectedly died, Kipling married the deceased man's sister, Carrie, in January 1892. The rush wedding was small, with only four people in attendance, because London had virtually come to a standstill. There was a crippling influenza epidemic sweeping the city. Kipling described the atmosphere in his biography as, It was in the thick of an influenza epidemic, when the undertakers had run out of black horses, and the dead had to be content with brown ones. The couple honeymooned in the United States for a time, and went on to Japan, where they received news that their bank had collapsed, and taken much of their fortune with it. They returned to the States, Carrie's home country, purchased a home near her family in Brattleboro, Vermont. Carrie Kipling discovered she was pregnant and gave birth to the couple's first child, Josephine, on December 29, 1892. 
In his biography, Kipling wrote that his daughter was born in three foot of snow on the night of 29 December, 1892. Her mother's birthday being the 31st and mine the 30th on the same month. We congratulated her on her sense of the fitness of things. Kipling described this period of his life as the happiest and most productive of his career. He loved living in the countryside of Vermont, away from the noisy cities or temptations like alcohol or opium. He wrote such classics as The Jungle Book, Captain's Courageous, both of which would later be made into films, and other books filled with short stories and poetry. Now this is the law of the jungle, as old and as true as the sky, and the wolf that shall keep it may prosper, but the wolf that shall break it must die. As the creeper that girdles the tree trunk, the law runneth forward and back, for the strength of the pack is the wolf, and the strength of the wolf is the pack. The Second Jungle Book, 1895. In 1896, Carrie gave birth to the couple's second child, a daughter named Elsie, and a son quickly followed in 1897, whom they named John. Kipling began telling his eldest daughter, Josephine, whom he called Effie, versions of his now-beloved just-so stories for little children, every night before bed. He said, in the evening there were stories meant to put Effie to sleep, and you were not allowed to alter those by one single little word that would be told just so, or Effie would wake up and put back the missing sentence. So at last they came to be like charms, all three of them, the whale tale, the camel tale, and the rhinoceros tale. The just-so stories are imaginative stories about how animals begin to look and act the way they do in nature. The titles detail each story. There's how the whale got his throat and how the camel got his hump. The enduring popularity of these stories speaks to the loving care with which Kipling wrote them for his children. I keep six honest serving men. They taught me all I knew. Their names are what and where and when and how and why. And who? The Elephant's Child, 1902. The Kipling's idyllic existence in the United States ended when Kipling had a public run-in with Carrie's brother, Beatty Ballister. Ballister struggled with addiction to alcohol and money troubles. After publicly threatening to blow off Kipling's head, Ballister was arrested and a trial followed, which drew quite a lot of attention from the press because of Kipling's popularity as an author. As for his part, Kipling seemed to mourn the loss of his privacy and eventually moved his family back to England in an effort to reclaim it. We're all islands, shouting lies to each other across seas of misunderstanding. The light that failed, 1891. Unfortunately, he suffered one of the largest losses of his life. The Kipling's eldest daughter, Josephine, age six, succumbed to pneumonia on March 6th, 1899. Kipling had been ill at the same time, and at first the family feared they would not, that they would lose them both. However, Kipling survived to discover that his daughter had not. The world is very lovely, and it is very horrible, and it doesn't care about your life or mine, or anything else. The Light That Failed, 1891. When the Just So Stories for Children was first published in 1902, Kipling illustrated the stories himself. The timing of the publication, so soon after the loss of Josephine, was particularly poignant. The loss forever after changed the author according to those close to him. The man who had once been described as a friend of the world smiled and laughed a little less often. Kipling's sister, Trix, said he became a sadder and a harder man. Kipling received the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1907 and remains the youngest person ever to have obtained the honor. But his star seemed already to be fading. He espoused imperialistic political ideas and encouraged countries to pursue imperialistic policies. Kipling wrote the poem, The White Man's Burden, in an effort to encourage the United States to take a more active role in the Philippines. Take up the white man's burden, send forth the best ye breed. Go bind your sons to exile, to serve your captive's need. The White Man's Burden, 1899. He was also in support of the Great War, World War I, and encouraged his son John to serve the conflict. At first, John failed a medical examination to join the Royal Navy because of his weak eyesight. He attempted to list two more times, but was rejected both times. And then using his father's connections, Kipling joined the Irish Guards, took part in the bloody Battle of Lewes, the largest British assault of 1915. John Kipling, age 18, was assumed to have been blown apart by shells, and no piece of his corpse was ever recovered for his family to mourn over. In 2015, the Commonwealth Grave Commission announced it had located the grave of John Kipling, whose remains had been buried in a French cemetery. If any question why we died, tell them. Because our fathers lied. Epitaphs of War, 1918. This second loss hit Kipling and his wife incredibly hard. Kipling said he read the novels of Jane Austen to his wife and remaining daughter over and over again in an effort to shake the grief he felt at John's death. 
He also joined the group that would later become the Commonwealth War Graves Commission in honor of his lost son. Kipling suggested some of the biblical verses the commission put on the stones of the war dead. He also wrote a regimental history of the Irish Guards, which was published in 1923. It has been considered by some to be one of the best examples of a regimental history ever penned. And there were, too, many, almost children of whom no record remains. They came out of Warley with the constant renewed drafts, lived the span of a second lieutenant's life, and were spent. The Irish Guards in the Great War, 1923. While mourning his lost children, Kipling's health began a steady decline. Kipling suffered from duodenal ulcers, which it is believed eventually killed him at age 70. The writer's ashes are interred at Westminster Abbey's Poet's Corner. It is forever into the remains of Thomas Hardy and Charles Dickens. Kipling's only surviving child, Elsie, married George Bambridge, a diplomat, in 1924. She never had any children, so Kipling's bloodline ended, and she died on April 24, 1976. Like some celebrities today, Kipling's death was reported ahead of its time. Reading about it in a magazine, he wrote to the magazine, I just read that I died. Don't forget to delete me from your list of subscribers. Many of his political viewpoints, notably about imperialism, no longer held sway in the international world as he grew older, and he did receive much criticism for that. George Orwell described him as a jingo imperialist who was morally insensitive and a gutter patriot. His literary career had a meteoric rise, but then seemed to stagnate, and he often spoke to friends about the foibles of early fame. Like his idyllic views of empire, in many ways, Rudyard Kipling seemed to become history even before his days had passed, especially in the way that the loss of his children affected him. But what is left of Rudyard Kipling when everything else is turned to dust are his writings. Like perhaps his most famous poem, If penned in 1895, which seems to represent his tragic life, but exhorts us all to be the best that we can be, even in the face of terrible loss. If you can make one heap of all your winnings, risk it on one turn of pitch and toss, lose, start again at your beginnings, never say one word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your term long after they are gone, and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will that tells them all hold on. If you can talk to crowds and keep your virtue, walk with kings nor lose the common touch. If neither foe nor loving friend can hurt you, if all men matter to you, but none too much. If you can fill the everlasting minute with 60 seconds of distance run, then yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And what's more, You'll be a man, my son. Pablo Picasso, a groundbreaking and prolific artist of thousands of paintings, sculptures, and other works, showed his brilliance from an early age. Throughout his career, his art went through several distinct phases, as did his love life. He's reported to have said, There are only two kinds of women, goddesses, and doormats. The women Picasso adored appeared in his paintings. Some bore his children, and almost all his affairs ended in tragedy, as if there was a dark side to loving the artist. His granddaughter, Marina Picasso, wrote in her memoir, His brilliant oeuvre demanded human sacrifice. He needed the blood of those who loved him, people who thought they loved a human being, whereas they really loved Picasso. The lives of the many muses of Pablo Picasso are history that deserve to be remembered. Picasso said, when I was a child, my mother said to me, if you become a soldier, you'll be a general. If you become a monk, you'll end up as the Pope. Instead, I became a painter and wound up as Picasso. He learned the basics of art at his father's studio, but his talent surpassed his father's abilities when he was still young. Picasso's first word, according to his family, was a shortened form of pencil. Picasso created compulsively, drawing and sketching for hours at a time until collapsing, exhausted, to rest and then start again. His prodigious talent earned Picasso a spot at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts at San Fernando, but he dropped out soon after being admitted. Picasso moved to Paris, where he honed his abilities even further and made friends with many of the artists there. He lived in poverty with the Bohemians of Paris, 
burning some of his early creations to stay warm. He is remembered for, among other accomplishments, as being one of the co-founders of Cubism. The unique art movement is considered by some art historians to be one of the most influential art developments of the 20th century. Cubism takes everyday objects or scenes, breaks them into their component parts, and then examines those parts from different viewpoints, creating geometric shapes and surreal designs. The creations evoke a strong response in the viewer, which seems to be unique to each person because of the way the human brain struggles to fill in the blanks left by the artist. Picasso seemed to innately understand this one-of-a-kind interaction between art and everyone who views it. He said, the pictures live only through the man who is looking at it. One of Picasso's first muses, Fernand Olivier, met the artist during his struggling early years in Paris. Olivier, born Emily Long in June 1881, had a difficult past. She was born out of wedlock, which was far more problematic during her lifetime than today, and raised by an aunt and uncle. When they arranged a marriage for her, Olivier ran away and married a man of her choice, who was abusive. She fled this marriage and hid from her husband in Paris, changing her name to complete her escape. Olivier met Picasso in 1904, when she was modeling for many of the artists of Paris. She was described as strikingly beautiful and caught the eye of many of the Bohemians with her lovely features. Picasso said he used Olivier as a model in 60 of his creations, including the model for the sculpture Head of a Woman, and as one of the women in his provocative and groundbreaking work, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. The rest of the women in the portrait, he claimed, were prostitutes. Les Demoiselles shocked the art world with French artist Henri Matisse proclaiming the portrait was not only a crime against art, but a personal affront. Despite or perhaps because of the visceral reactions to the creation, Picasso and his art was catapulted onto the world stage. Olivier and Picasso's love affair lasted for seven years. She adopted a 13-year-old girl in order to create a family with the artist, perhaps in an effort to secure his affections for herself. But Olivier returned the child to the orphanage after she discovered graphic and nude sketches of the girl by Picasso. Olivier ended their relationship soon after. Later in life, and struggling to escape poverty, she published a series of articles about her relationship with Picasso, who had gone on to such incredible fame. Picasso sued to prevent the publication of the articles and was eventually successful. Forgotten, nearly deaf, and suffering from crippling arthritis, Olivier lived on a small pension provided by the artist until she died in 1966 at the age of 85. Marcel Humbert, who was called Eva Goel by Picasso, was Olivier's friend in Picasso's next notable relationship. Like most of his relationships, Picasso was obsessed with Goel and was known to have signed some of his works I Love Ava during their time together. Goel, for her part, helped organize and clean Picasso's home, except for his studio, which he refused to straighten. She was also helpful to the artist in his business enterprises, assisting in the sale of pieces and encouraging Picasso to add more color to his creations. She was with Picasso for four years, seemed to experience little of his more negative moods. Goel said, to look at him, you would think he would be violent but he is really like a lamb. Sadly, Goel developed tuberculosis and died at age 30. Picasso was despondent, but found comfort in the arms of Gabby Lespinance, a 27-year-old who lived nearby. Picasso didn't introduce Lespinance to his friends, and few knew they even had an affair until she sold some of his paintings in the 1950s. The affair was not just kept secret because Goel was on her deathbed, but also because Les Benas was dating an American named Henry Les Benas, and she'd already taken his name. They married a year later. Picasso gave her some beads and a few paintings, one of which had a passionate note attached to the frame that said, I have asked the good God for your hand. There were some watercolors and sketches of rooms where they purportedly carried on their affair that supposedly had erotic inscriptions by the artist, but which were thought to have been etched out by Les Benas to protect her reputation. Olga Koklova, a tall Russian ballerina, was the next notable muse in Picasso's life. He met her after designing the set and costumes for a ballet Koklova was performing in. Shortly after she began a relationship with Picasso, Koklova injured her foot and, though it healed after some time, she never danced in public again. Nearly a decade younger than Picasso, Koklova was descended from Russian nobility, expected a commitment of marriage from Picasso before she would sleep with him. He acquiesced, and Koklova gave him his first child, a boy, they named Paolo. Koklova believed in a well-run household and disliked some of his more bohemian friends. She hired a chauffeur to drive Picasso around and insisted that he live more like the famous artist that he was becoming. Koklova was a jealous wife. 
but she couldn't prevent him from having his affairs. The unhappy marriage peaked when Koklova discovered Picasso had been in a ten-year-long affair with a girl next door named Marie-Therese Walter. The relationship had started when Walter was only 17, and now she was pregnant with Picasso's child. Koklova demanded a divorce, which Picasso was unwilling to give. Instead, she relocated to France, remained technically married to the artist for the rest of her life. Koklova developed cancer, died in 1955. Towards the end of her life, she asked to see Picasso again, but the artist did not go to see her or attend her funeral. Marie-Therese Walter, a French woman, gave birth to Picasso's daughter, Maya, in September 1935. Walter's depictions in Picasso's works are noted for the bright colors he used. She is credited as the muse for a collection of a hundred etchings that Picasso called the Voyard Suite. Her pregnancy with Picasso's child was captured by the artist in his work The Rev, or The Dream. Their child, Maya, was the model for Picasso's cubism-style portrait called Maya the Doll. Picasso moved in with Walter for a period of time, but two months after the birth of Maya, he met Dora Maar, his next muse. He carried on affairs with both women, then 26 and 28 years old, to the artist's 54 years. There's an apocryphal story that Walter came to Picasso's studio when Mar was there, and the two had a literal wrestling match over who would be with the artist. Picasso was said to have remarked that the wrestling match over his attention was a choice memory, but later Picasso and the women denied the incident had ever happened. Picasso went on to pursue his relationship with Mar and many others. When Koklova died in 1955, Picasso called Walter and asked her to marry him. She refused. Despite being younger than Picasso, Walter wouldn't long outlive him, committing suicide in October 1977, a mere four years after the artist's natural death. There was speculation that she committed the act because of her lingering attachment to Picasso. Dora Maar, whom Picasso considered more of an intellectual equal than Walter, worked closely with the artist. She was a talented painter and photographer, notably photographing the disastrous results on many Americans of the 1929 crash on Wall Street. Marr opened a studio in Paris, working in commercial photography for a time. She also held solo exhibits, and her work was published in Parisian magazines. Marr's birth name was Henrietta Theodora Markovich, and she was raised in Argentina by Croatian and French parents. The promising photographer was introduced to Picasso in 1936, shortly after she was working as a set photographer on the film The Crime of Monsieur Lang. Journalist Jean-Paul Crespier described Marr and Picasso's first meeting in a café. She kept driving a small pointed penknife between her fingers into the wood of the table. Sometimes she missed, and a drop of blood appeared between the roses embroidered on her black gloves. Picasso asked Dora to give him the gloves, and locked them up in the showcase he kept for his mementos. During their nine-year affair, Mar was amused for and worked with Picasso on some of his art. Mar painted a few of the pieces of Picasso's masterwork, Guernica, work in which he started to express his feelings about war and its horrors. She also documented Guernica's creation. The portraits Picasso created of Marr were noticeably darker than those for his previous muse, Walter. One of the more famous ones, the weeping woman, was depicting Marr. Picasso says he thought Marr was always a weeping woman for him. Part of Marr's misery may have been due to the fact that she was unable to have children. When Picasso eventually left Marr for his next muse, she sought therapy, including electroshock treatments to soothe her heartache and deep depression. Marr expressed the darkness in her heart when she said, after Picasso, only God. Sadly, Picasso was said to have physically abused Marr during their relationship and then teased her about his other women after their relationship ended. He shared erotic artwork he had done of her body even though she wanted to keep it private. He bought her a house, which she lived in for a while, and she died a virtual recluse in 1997 at the age of 89. Since her death, the world has only started now to rediscover the paintings of Dora Marr. When she was with Picasso, he insisted she paint in his favorite Cubist style, but later, during Mars' time away from the artist, she was able to paint in her own style, preferring landscapes. A retrospective of Mars' work was shown in Paris from June through July of this year. Francois Gillot, a talented and ambidextrous painter, met Picasso in the spring of 1943. Picasso was at a restaurant with Mar and friends when Gillot sat at another table with her own friends. He brought over a bowl of cherries and introduced himself to the beautiful young woman, who was only 21 years old at the time. A few years later, Gillot and Picasso moved in together, and she bore the artist two children. She served as the model for the painting, the Femme Fleur. Their relationship ended in 1953, with Gillot walking away from the artist, one of the few, if only women in Picasso's life, to do so. She wrote a book about their time together. Life with Picasso was incredibly popular and sold over one million copies in its first year. Picasso tried to prevent the book's publication, but failed. 
He reportedly was so enraged over the book that he disinherited he and Gillot's two children because of it. Life with Picasso was republished by the New York Review of Books, Classics, in June 2019. Perhaps in retaliation, Picasso told the art dealers he worked with not to purchase any paintings by Gillot in an effort to stall her career, but she continued to paint. Gillot went on to design sets and costumes for productions at the Guggenheim. She married artist Luke Simon in 1955, but they divorced in 1962. She then married Jonas Salk, the researcher behind one of the first successful polio vaccines. Gillot, in her 90s now, is still alive and exhibiting her art. In a feature interview in June of this year by Thessaly LaForce for the New York Times Magazine, Gillot said, The most important thing in life is to be true to yourself. You can be true to others if you have time. Picasso saw his final muse, Jacqueline Roque, at a party in 1961. He was 72 years old and she was 26. She refused to date him at first, knowing his poor reputation with women, but he ardently pursued her. He sent her a rose every day until she relented. Roque's childhood was rather tragic. Her father abandoned the family when she was very young, and her mother died when Roque was only 18. She married at 19 and had a daughter, but Roque's first marriage didn't last. When she finally agreed to have a relationship with Picasso, she told him if he took another muse, she'd leave him in a heartbeat. They married in March 1961 and remained together until Picasso's death. He created more portraits of Roque than any of his other muses. When the artist died in 1973 at age 91, witnesses said Roque was so upset that she slept on the snow-covered grave where they buried Picasso's body. She never got along with Picasso's four children and argued with the rest of the family over Picasso's property. Roque endured life without Picasso until 1986, when she committed suicide. Pablo Picasso is arguably one of the most prolific artists of all time, almost maniacally creating art throughout his entire life, which lasted 91 years. The genius of his vision is still readily apparent even years after his death. The women that modeled for him and inspired some of his most famous artworks had their lives overshadowed by his great talent. In 2015, Picasso's work, The Femme d'Age, version O, sold at auction for $179.4 million, highest amount ever paid for an artwork up until that time. And that's not even considering the cost in broken hearts and lives that Picasso left in his wake. If it were not for his younger brother, the world may never have seen the famous paintings Starry Night, Wheatfield with Crows, or Sunflowers, all works created by the famous and troubled Vincent van Gogh. Though he did not achieve success during his lifetime, van Gogh's paintings are some of the most valued works in the world. In 2015, van Gogh's Allier des Alicamps sold for $63.3 million at a Sotheby auction. The most expensive painting to ever be sold at auction is van Gogh's The Portrait of Dr. Gachet, which was purchased for a jaw-dropping $82.5 million at an auction in May of 1990. But beyond the monetary value of his paintings, Vincent van Gogh, whose name I won't be butchering by attempting the Dutch pronunciation, has come to typify that idea of a struggling, tortured artist whose creative passions undermine what otherwise might have been a contented life. His untimely death at the age of 37 was followed shortly thereafter by the death of the subject of today's episode. His brother's unwavering support, both emotionally and financially, of Vincent van Gogh allowed the artist to create some of the world's most enduring masterworks. And while his contributions, not just to his brother's paintings, but to the development of contemporary art, are not well known, Theodorus Theo van Gogh deserves to be remembered. Theo van Gogh was born in the southern Netherlands on the 1st of May, 1857. He was one of a half dozen children born to Theodorus van Gogh and Anna Cornelia Carbentis. Theo's older brother, Vincent, was the eldest surviving child of the family, although another boy, also named Vincent, had been born but died about a year before Vincent's birth. Theodorus van Gogh, their father, was a minister in the Dutch Reformed Church, a Protestant religion founded in 1571. As a minister, he didn't receive a large salary, but the church cared for the family's needs by providing a house, two cooks, a gardener, made a horse and carriage. Their mother, Anna, had been described by some historians as strict and religious woman who would accompany her husband as he visited his parishioners. Her father, William Carbentus, was a bookbinder who had the honor of binding the 1848 Constitution of the Netherlands, thus being called the bookbinder to the king. Perhaps because of her father, Anna loved to read and write letters to her friends and family, something that she ultimately passed on to her sons, who exchanged hundreds of letters back and forth over the course of their relatively short lives. 
none of the Van Gogh children were described as having a strong constitution, except for Vincent. Theo shared Vincent's coloring, reddish hair and blue eyes, that had a tendency to darken to a greenish blue. Theo and Vincent originally studied at the local school, but their parents became convinced that the country children were ruining their manners, and so hired a governess to teach them at home. The brothers became close even when they were young, and Theo would later reminisce about the delightful games they played together in the family's home in Zundert in the province of Brabant. After one of his many bouts with mental illness, Vincent remembered the peaceful days of his childhood. He wrote, During my illness, I saw again every room in the house at Zundert, every path, every plant in the garden, the view of the fields outside, the neighbors, the graveyard, the church, our kitchen garden at the back, down to a magpie's nest in a tall acacia in the graveyard. But the idyllic days did not last. Vincent was sent to a boarding school in Zevenbergen, where he is believed to have been desperately unhappy. He would remember this period of his life as austere and cold and sterile. With some assistance from an uncle, also named Vincent, who was a successful art dealer, the younger Vincent found a job at Goupil & Company in July 1869, selling art prints and reproductions to middle-class purchasers. Vincent van Gogh would not begin creating the art that would make his legacy to the world until his late twenties. Theo would join his brother at the firm of Goupil & Company in January 1873, the youngest employee there. Theo seemed to thrive at the art dealership while his brother, Vincent, did not. Vincent's temperament was not a good fit for a salesperson. He was eventually fired for taking a vacation without seeking permission from his employers first. But everyone in Vincent's family knew that the art dealership was not going to be Vincent's future. Theo wrote, when the apple is ripe, a soft breeze will make it fall from the tree. And such was the case here. Vincent entertained the idea of becoming a minister like his father, but he didn't want to spend another seven years in school trying to become a clergyman. He worked for a time as a bookseller and a school teacher before finally settling on his desire to become an artist. Vincent was 27 years old when he began seriously painting. He found it distracted him from his inner turmoil, which was beginning to show more and more. He wrote, I said to myself, I will take up my pencil. I will go on with my drawing. From that moment, everything has seemed transformed to me. His family was troubled by his seemingly erratic behavior, which was intertwined with his own version of religious asceticism. Vincent would refuse to bathe and insist on sleeping on the floor, even when a comfortable bed was available for his use. He didn't eat very much, mainly crusts of breads, and had a thin appearance. His mother wrote, I am always so afraid that wherever Vincent may be or whatever he may do, he will spoil everything by his eccentricity, his queer ideas and views on life. And his father was of the same opinion. It grieves us so to see that he literally knows no joy of life, but always walks with a bent head, whilst we did all in our power to bring him to an honorable position. It seems as if he deliberately chooses the most difficult path. The intensity of Vincent's passions disturbed others beyond his immediate family. Vincent fell in love with his cousin, Cornelia Key Vos Stricker, but she turned down his marriage proposal. He refused to accept it and approached Cornelia's parents with his pleas. According to legend, he held his hand in the flame of a lamp and demanded, let me see her for as long as I can keep my hand in the flame. Eventually, Vincent was driven off by Cornelia's father, mainly because he seemed unable to support himself, let alone a wife and family. Meanwhile, Theo was finding a successful career in the art dealership world. He worked at branches at Goupil and Company and The Hague in Brussels, and was eventually transferred to Paris, where he found himself at the forefront of the contemporary art scene. Theo's work helped bring, among others, the artist Claude Monet and Edgar Degas to the public's adoring eye. Theo sent his brother money for food and art supplies and also tried to introduce him to other contemporary artists so that he might form some friendships with people who shared his interest. But Vincent's personality was so prickly that the friendships never seemed to last. One of the artists Theo introduced his brother to was Anton von Rappard, a Dutch painter. They had a correspondence of nearly five years, but had a disagreement that Van Rappau said he regretted for the rest of his life in a letter to Vincent's mother after the artist's death. Van Rappau wrote, Whoever had witnessed this wrestling, struggling, and sorrowful existence could not but feel sympathy for the man who demanded so much of himself that it ruined body and mind. He belonged to the breed that produces the great artists. Theo and Vincent wrote to each other often, and many of Vincent's letters to Theo have been preserved. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said for Theo's letters to Vincent, which seem to have been lost. It is through these preserved letters that historians have learned so much about Vincent's life. Of the more than 800 letters Vincent van Gogh wrote that are still in existence, approximately three quarters of them are written to his brother, Theo. When Vincent eventually committed suicide, an unfinished letter to his brother, Theo, was discovered in his pocket. 
Theo, who had spent his life honing his art dealer skills to spot and nurture talent, would offer Vincent encouragement and helpful criticisms of his work. Vincent, while developing his art skills, took in a pregnant prostitute, Cian Hornick, and her child, who were in need of shelter. He used Hornick as the model for his now famous sketch, Sorrow. Vincent added the line, How can there be on earth a woman, alone, abandoned? To the sketch, which was a quotation from the author Jules Michelet, it showed Vincent's belief that poverty was the cause of many of Earth's sorrows, like prostitution. Hornick would return to her old life, and Vincent let her go, unable to provide for the woman and her children. He continued to believe that poverty was what kept her trapped in her situation, and wrote to Theo, She has never seen what is good. How can she be good? Tragically, Hornick would eventually end her life by throwing herself in a river. Vincent went to live with his parents, who provided shelter for him, and wrote to Theo of his continued progress. Vincent sketched the local weavers, miners, and anyone who wanted to model for him. His artwork was dark and shadowy, displaying little of the vibrant colors that would make his later works so memorable. Vincent wrote to Theo, angry that his brother had been unable to sell any of his artwork yet. He wrote, A wife you cannot give me, a child you cannot give me, work you cannot give me. Money, yes, but what good is it to me if I must do without the rest? He fell out of favor with the locals when one of his models turned up pregnant and the rumor was that he was the father. Partly to escape the scandal, he moved to Antwerp to study at the Royal Academy of Fine Art, but then left the school over creative differences with his professors. He then moved to Paris and lived with Theo for a time. At first, Theo was encouraged with Vincent's progress and wrote their parents, If we can continue to live together like this, I think the most difficult period is past and he will find his way. But living with Vincent was nearly impossible. As time went by, Theo stopped bringing friends home because they would inevitably get into a fight with his brother. He wrote to their sister, My home life is almost unbearable. No one wants to come and see me anymore because it always ends in quarrels. And besides, he is so untidy that the room looks far from attractive. I wish he would go and live by himself. Vincent moved to Commune on the north side of Paris and eventually to Arles, where he immersed himself in his art and produced nearly 200 paintings. He loved his time in the country and it reminded him of his childhood home. Vincent wrote to Theo, My great regret is that you cannot see what I am seeing here. Theo married Johanna Bonger, whom he had met through her brother Andres. He wrote to his parents that he was engaged, and two days later, Vincent cut off a part of his own ear after a fight with fellow artist Paul Gauguin. According to legend, Vincent presented his severed ear to a prostitute at a brothel he frequented. His behavior was becoming even more erratic, and the townspeople described the artist as the red-headed madman. Vincent went to an asylum after that and wrote to his brother, The kindness you have had for me isn't lost. Only transfer this affection onto your wife as much as possible. His mental highs and lows became more pronounced. It was from an asylum window that Vincent saw the scene that would go on to become immortalized in the work, Starry Night. Theo and Johanna had a son in January 1890 that they named Vincent in honor of Theo's brother. But Vincent killed himself in July of that year by shooting himself in the chest with a pistol. Theo was by his brother's side when he died, and he said Vincent's last words were, the sadness will last forever. Vincent was buried in the Uvo Sorise Cemetery, and Theo attended his funeral, where he seemed to become unhinged by Vincent's death. He gave up his long-standing job as an art dealer and started a new business, exclusively selling Vincent's paintings. Theo's former employer said he became a madman of sorts, like his brother. He was committed to an asylum by October of 1890, and then in January 1891, six months after the death of Vincent, Theo died from chronic illness, excessive exertion, and sorrow, although modern understanding of his condition calls it an organic illness. Historians believe that Vincent van Gogh might have been suffering from bipolar disorder or maybe a metabolic condition, or both, which he exacerbated by starving himself, drinking alcohol, and working too hard. Though Theo was originally buried elsewhere, Johanna had his body exhumed and buried next to his brother, Vincent. She published their private correspondence in 1914, and through multiple art displays and sales, managed to make Van Gogh a household name. Theo Van Gogh understood his brother more than anybody else, and he recognized the difficulty in balancing creative impulses with real life. He said, One of the most difficult things is that whether in good or bad health, he is so cut off from the outer world. But if you knew him, you would be doubly aware of how difficult it is to solve the question of what can and must be done for him. But it is through Theo's efforts that the world would come to know his troubled brother's genius. 
I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section and I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe. <laughs>